In January 2012, Tony Nicholson began a high court battle to end his life. In 2005, Nicholson suffered a stroke, which left him paralysed, though not in a vegetative state. In a recent article in The Guardian, Nicholson stated that all he had to look forward to was, quote, a wretched ending with uncertainty, pain and suffering whilst my family watch on helplessly, end quote. The feeling that one is a burden to others is common amongst people who are suffering painful disabling and terminal illnesses and is cited by 47% of respondents as a possible reason for hastening their own death. Furthermore, studies have also shown a strong correlation between depression and a desire for physician-assisted suicide PAS, or euthanasia. Such findings raise two very important questions. Firstly, is self-perceived burden and depression, which both can generally be relieved by appropriate support and effective treatment, appropriate reasons to grant a request for PAS or euthanasia? Secondly, is Nicholson's request to end his life due primarily to a lack of confidence in alternative options, i.e. palliative care? This video will argue against the proposal that the terminally ill should be offered medical assistance to end their lives. Instead, palliative care for the dying should be improved through integrating them into mainstream NHS services. Currently, most specialist palliative care provision is left to charities. In order to illustrate my argument, I will focus on PASS and to a lesser extent euthanasia by examining practical models provided by Oregon and the Netherlands where these procedures are legalised. Attempts to legalise euthanasia in the UK have repeatedly been rejected by Parliament. As a react reaction to the rejection, campaigners such as Lord Jofe have shifted their focus from euthanasia to PASS. Jofe's most recent version of the assisted dying for the terminally ill bill based on the Oregon model was rejected for the third time in 2006, due primarily to it being dangerously vague and subjective. Furthermore, medical professionals, many of whom will be on the front line if such procedures are legalised, have shown great resistance to the bill. In fact, research has revealed that over 90% of doctors working within palliative care oppose euthanasia and pass. Those who are in favour of the legalisation of euthanasia and pass in the UK often market their campaign by citing these procedures as allowing the terminally ill to die in a dignified and peaceful manner. In 2005, Scottish parliamentarian Jeremy Purvis drafted a consultation paper entitled Dying with Dignity, which aimed to legalise PASS in Scotland. However, such a title is a misnomer. Research has found that complications, for example twitching, spasms, nausea or vomiting, occurred in 7% of cases of PASS, and problems with completion, i.e. a longer than expected time to death, failure to induce coma or coma followed by the awakening of the patient, occurred in 16% of cases. In 18% of cases which started as PASS, the physician decided to administer the lethal medication which resulted in euthanasia. In the Netherlands, 20% of cases were completed using lethal injection, a method also employed in the USA where in 35 states the death penalty still exists. Yet even in the USA, with the country's 30 years of experience of practising the procedure, a number of lethal injections have been blocked, with some executions lasting between 20 minutes to over an hour. Therefore, collectively, this research suggests that death through the use of excessive and lethal substances cannot guarantee a peaceful and dignified death, but instead leaves one vulnerable to unnecessary and avoidable suffering. Supporters of euthanasia and PATS cite watertight safeguards as a preventative against abuses of law. Yet, in the Netherlands, abuses of the law have been documented. These range from euthanasia without consent, estimated at a thousand cases per year, to the current legal practice of euthanasia on babies. Furthermore, there is also evidence of false reporting and under-reporting. In the Netherlands, 20% of cases are not reported to the authorities. It would be ignorant to assume that the UK can avoid the complications and corruption cited if these procedures were to be legalised. Yet, those who are in favour of euthanasia and PASS will no doubt continue to persist in their campaign for the legalisation of these procedures. However, unlike PASS and euthanasia, improvement to the care of the dying does not require a change in legislation in the UK but rather depends on fresh approaches to end-of-life decision-making and the provision of care.
In such an approach, if such an approach is adopted, then perhaps Nicholson and many who have come before him, including Diane Pretty, Daniel James and Debbie Purdy, will not feel the need to fight to loosen the law on the right to die.